The following is a production of Phoenix Media. The views expressed do not necessarily represent those of the company or its advertisers and may contain language that's unsuitable for younger listeners. Welcome to the Doggish Podcast, the only podcast dedicated to the dog parents and the topics, events, and personalities impacting their lives today. My name is Jason, uh, co-founder of Forever USA, a dog photography experience for you and the dog who stole your heart. Uh, and we're actually, we have um, photography classes for at-home dog moms now, so definitely check that out. As always, I'm sitting here with my kick-ass co-host, Miss Sylvia Wess, uh, owner of Dog Up in This Bitch, and she is a phenomenal dog specialist and training extraordinaire. How are you today? Um, I'm good. I just... Uh, I heard you have, have a, this... you have a handful of... A... I have... I have a, a lot oh, got, of dogs going on in yeah. my home. I've got a weird cough that's happening. So, mm -hmm. you know, my mic will be like doing weird things throughout the podcast while I hack up a lung over here. Didn't even notice it. You know what I did notice? Yes. I noticed that we got to talk with an absolutely incredible organization. Oh my gosh, that is we're making so huge excited. Yep. Oh my gosh, yes. These two ladies are killing it. They are, got innovative during COVID and... Man, they're doing some awesome stuff that I think is going to have Jimena and Liana lifetime of an impact. Yep. They're with Haas. Uh, and um, let's just get into it. Yeah, let's do this. Let's, let's, get let's into just it. go. All right. I am so excited to meet you guys both today and learn a little bit more about uh, Haas and everything that this project and program is really starting to unveil. Um, could you guys both introduce yourselves? Um, you, you have both lovely and unique names that I would love to hear more about. Sure. So I can go first. Um, my name is Jimena Salgado Santa Maria. That was, that was a great. That was like, bam. No, we heard uh, briefly just before uh, that's a, a warrior princess name, correct? Yes. Spanish warrior princess that my mom read about when she was 14. <laughs> and what are, you, what are you doing for... Um, uh, Haas, Jimena. I'm the Keeping Families Together Program Manager. Cool. Excited to hear what that is. Very good. And cool. Miss Liana, is, do I have that right? Yeah, that was correct. That was actually very good. My name is Liana, um, and I am the Keeping Families Together Implementation Coordinator. Wow. Okay. So that's a title. Right. It's so five uh, times fast. <laughs> wow. Like you guys just sound so official right now. <laughs> that's what I'm talking about. So what is, um, what is that? Like if you guys could explain your, your titles a little bit about what those are. Yeah. So with Haas, which is a human animal support services project, um, the biggest goal is keeping people and pets together. And so Liana and I were hired back last fall because of the huge eviction crisis that was looming over us back then it was extended until December 31st, but that was still a really scary date. And we were expecting like 30 to 40 million people to be facing, facing eviction. And oh, with wow. over 60% of people in the United States, over 60% of households have pets. Um, that's if you do the math, it's like millions and millions of pets that would be um, at risk of being surrendered. So our goal was to come on board with the focus of keeping families together and creating resources for animal shelters to be prepared as much as possible for that deadline of January 1st, when the, the moratorium would expire. And what has happened with that moratorium since? Like, is that, like, how did that? It's still intact. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it's been extended. Um, with the new administration, with the Biden administration, um, and a transition with leadership, as well as with the CDC, they've extended the moratorium till I believe, um, June. Is that correct? Hey, man, or is it September? I was just looking it up today, and there's some different things going around, but officially, it's still March 31st. Oh, never mind. Mm -hmm. uh, there's also that's, a, there's that's a coming up so quick. Like, wow. There's also a hold on um, uh, housing foreclosures till I believe June. So there's a little bit of different policy depending on if you own your home or if you're renting your home. Mm. Okay. And so what you guys, the, and maybe 
definitely keep me on track with this. So the whole purpose of Haas is to help people keep their animals together as a family unit going through this potentially very difficult time. Yeah, and in a broader scope, it's more about reimagining how shelters work. So animal shelters in the past have been really, have had like a transactional approach. You know, you come in, you can't take care of your animal. They'll take them, they'll, you know, they'll allow you to surrender them and then that's it, you're on your way. It's just like, you do one thing, you get one thing done and and then families aren't giving more resources to, to consider how they can stay with their pets. And so now that the conversations have become, all right, how can we offer more support and become more community centered? How can we partner with human services so that more families can get the resources they need in order to stay together? Sometimes Mm -hmm. it's just pet food that they can't afford and that's all they need in order to keep their pets. Sometimes it's just some uh, medical care that they need. And so it's looking at all the different things, all the different barriers that we can try to reduce as an, as a sector um, and who we can partner with so we can help the family in total, right? Cause pets are a part of our families. So considering that as a, as a more important part of the conversation, because a lot of times mm-hmm. pets are just considered property, but really there are family members and we love them so much. And when we have to, face the fact that we can't we can't keep them with us if we're if we're losing our housing or if we have to live somewhere that they don't allow pets that's such a hard decision to make and so many folks are having to do that right now so how can the shelter expand their services how can the shelter open their minds or or partner with other folks so that we can actually keep pets and families together so are you guys partnering with shelters are you guys working just directly with the public a little bit of both a little bit of both so we have um now 19 what we call tier one animal shelters or organizations that we work directly with. Um, In my role as implementation coordinator, it's really about communicating and navigating with these shelters through the keeping families together um, program process. So not just with the eviction crisis, but with really basic services that we can provide beyond the eviction and coronavirus crisis. So um, distributing food, um, finding temporary placement for people who may spend a week or two in the hospital. Um, So Mm. we worked about 19. However, we spoke with our director recently, and apparently there are hundreds of shelters across the country who are trying to join this Haas or human animal support services model. Um, So beyond this, we're hoping this will uh, really be implemented nationally and even into Canada. We have some uh, shelters in Canada who are joining us. Wow. So it's growing fast. Yeah. And aside from those shelters, we have like over 600 collaborators across the U.S. and Canada. Um, And it's even spreading into different sectors. We have people from housing agencies. We have people from um, domestic violence shelters. We have people from across the board, different areas that are really finding this topic really interesting and how we can support the whole family, including pets. I think this is a great place to just take a quick break. Um, We're going to come right back. This is, my mind is already, I'm not talking because I'm just like, oh, wow. Um, but we'll be right back. I have some burning, yearning questions myself. Dear John, I'm leaving. Uncontrolled high blood pressure is serious and I can quit whenever I want. Why can't we get back to when you checked on me? I don't want to leave. But remember, when I quit, you quit. Sincerely, your heart. Listen to your heart and don't let it quit on you. High blood pressure can lead to a stroke, heart attack, or death. Get yours to a healthy range today. For help keeping yours at a healthy range, text PRESSURE to 97779. A message from the American Heart Association, the American Stroke Association, and the Ad Council. WWE superstar Alberto Del Rio. Take one. Behold the angry giant. Try it again, Alberto. Behold the angry giant. Perfect. Good luck tonight. Behold The Angry Giant. Yay! Read me another one, Dad. This is WWE superstar Alberto Del Rio. It only takes a moment to make a moment. Take time to be a dad today. Visit fatherhood.gov. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services and the Ad Council. It may be hard to believe, but people just like you are already saving money. Feedthepig.org makes it easy. Their simple savings plan teaches you how to start saving. Without going overboard. So you don't need to sell all your belongings and live in a commune. These dungarees belong to all of us now, Tom. You don't need to get a second job as a stuntman. We need a new stuntman! You just need FeedThePig.org. Don't get left behind. Get tips and tools at FeedThePig.org. Brought to you by the American Institute of CPAs and the Ad Council. 
I spend a lot of time in the backyard, and I'm the center of attention at summer barbecues. In 96, I made some of the tastiest s'mores. And at 09, it was me, your backyard fire pit, that accidentally started a wildfire when a summer breeze carried one of my embers into some dry brush. Spark a change, not a wildfire. Visit SmokeyBear.com, brought to you by the U.S. Forest Service, your state forester, and the Ad Council. Only you can prevent wildfires. My name is Lola Silvestri, and I'm going to be 95 this year. I was very independent. I fell, and I had to have meals on wheels. America, let's do lunch. One in six seniors faces the threat of hunger, and millions more live in isolation. Drop off a hot meal and say a quick hello. Volunteer for Meals on Wheels by donating your lunch break at americaletsdolunch.org. This message brought to you by Meals on Wheels America and the Ad Council. (laughs) Hey, everyone. Let's all stop what we're doing and take a moment. You see? Every moment can be kind of special. But they can be loud moments, goofy moments, dorky moments, it doesn't matter. Because every time dads like us take a moment like that to spend with our kids, well, it's pretty momentous. So let's take a moment to make a moment. Call 877-4DAD411 or visit fatherhood.gov. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services and the Ad Council. You're listening to Phoenix Media. Listen live and explore more great shows at phoenixmedia.us. Okay, so we're back here with Jimena and uh, Liana. So I, I have a question. I don't know if this is going to uh, align properly or not. Um, but as you guys were coming on the show, um, so you guys are part of Haas. But uh, correct me if I'm wrong. You also, there's um, Austin Pets Alive. Is that right? And then yeah. your email address is American Pet Alive. So can you guys add some clarity? Like, it, like I, I see all these different things coming together. Yeah, it's completely confusing. We get it. <laughs> <laughs> Why are there so many moving pieces? <laughs> Why is it pet welfare simple? <laughs> hey, Meta, do you want to do you want to take? Yeah, that? so I, I can I can try. So, um, it all started off with American. Well, sorry, with Austin Pets Alive. Austin Pets Alive is a shelter down in Austin, and they're doing some really amazing work. Um, and and then from American Pets Alive came this like branch where they started creating training courses um, of an apprenticeships uh, sponsored by Maddie's Fund, um, where they they were trying to just provide resources for shelter staff on how to provide more better services and and be more innovative and just provide more training and resources. And so that be so let me like, let me jump in real quick because there was a there was a name that you dropped that um, is. It's a huge, huge name in animal welfare, but most of the public doesn't really know who that's they are knowledge. or what they do. Um, and that's the the thanks to Maddie's, uh, Maddie's mm-hmm. Fund. Maddie's and fund. their only purpose is r- giving funds to animal welfare project. Like they don't, they're, they're not a fundraiser, they're not anything like that. And there's a little bit of the backstory. I'd love to have them on the show sometime. But <laughs> So Maddie's Fund, all they do is they just help other nonprofits and shelters and rescues across the United States um, to do amazing projects like this and others. So, sorry, I didn't mean to derail you, but it's such an important name. Yeah, no, and I'm glad you said that because they this year they gave so much money to all of our shelters, and they've they're just they've been a wonderful sponsor. And like you said, they really believe in animal shelters and animal welfare organizations, and they're doing a really amazing work. So, yeah. Oh, I would love to. Have you guys ever met Dave? No. So, so Maddie was a little schnauzer that Dave owned. So Dave Duffield is the, uh, the original founder of Maddie's fund. And so if you, if you've seen Maddie's fund, they've got the, the schnauzer, that's their logo. And he had made a promise to her that he was going to do this before she passed away a while back. Sweet. It's a really sweet story. Okay. Anyways, Jason, so why I'm, are I'm you hell bent on always making me cry in these <laughs> uh, I'm just you, trying to have a lovely Saturday oh, morning. <laughs> it's very it's very sweet like there's there's so much more i don't want to derail from from okay this. <laughs> so back to what you yeah, back to, back okay. to haas. so <laughs> you got some funding from maddie's fund to fund this incredible project haas and action so american pets alive has been around for a bit i'm not sure how long but they've been around for a while and then when covid started um from american pets alive came the the push to start human animal support services so it's three different names but they're all connected 
Um, and they're all, we're all under Austin Pets Alive. So we are technically employees of Austin Pets Alive. Um, so it's, uh, Haas started with COVID because all of the shelters across the US were being cleared out. And so this was like a really cool opportunity for them to be like, all right, now we have all this space. Now we have all this time. How can we address the situation that's going on right now? And how can we just take this time to brainstorm and be innovative and like think of new opportunities and new ways to grow as an industry? And then that's how the program grew and it just like multiplied and, and became this huge movement. Um, but yeah. Wow. Okay. So that, and that was going to be my next question. So you've totally derailed me. Like, was, was like this was something that just I've started never seen Jason before so COVID disarmed. I am <laughs> hanging in there today. Okay. So, so that was my question. Like, um, so this is a project that started um, almost exclusively because of COVID and yeah. almost pre thinking the problems that could be coming down the mm. road. Um, yeah. I've talked to a lot of people, everybody from vets to just the random person on the street. Are you guys still anticipating an influx of homeless animals? Because there's a, there's a couple things, right? Because we've got, we're mm -hmm. dealing with the, the housing crisis that's potentially coming down the road. Mm -hmm. But we also have um, people going back to work. So mm -hmm. like they get to keep their house, they keep they, they go back to life as normal. Um, but there's going to be a certain amount of the population that just has to go back to what their regular life is. And that's been one of the saddest parts about for me being in yeah. aware of animal welfare, some people would just be like, I'm done with this dog. Now I'm going to go ahead and drop him back off. Um, are, are you guys seeing any evidence that this could show back up? Well, certainly the housing crisis is our, is the biggest concern. As Jimena said, there's, um, if you do the math, it's about 18 million animals could be at risk of eviction um, or foreclosure at the end of the, um, of the moratorium. So, that's certainly a really big concern. Um, the hope is that we already have seen shelters adopting a more foster centric model, um, focusing on getting animals out of the physical building of a shelter or a mm. rescue and into the homes of foster families. Um, and this is a testament to the public, frankly. Uh, I worked at Pima Animal Care Center when the coronavirus hit, when we, you know, it, March happened. We didn't know about the disease. We really thought that we would be flooded with thousands of animals coming in, uh, people sick. And there was also that horrible rumor that pets could spread the coronavirus. Mm -hmm. So we put out a plea to our Tucson community, begging people to basically come and foster. And we luckily had that foster centric model kind of already set up. So we had the infrastructure, but the community responded. We put about a thousand animals in foster. And then wow. as months went on, the intake didn't increase. So we, they, they really transferred to a foster centric model without that increase in animals. Um, but the, the concern is primarily with the housing, housing um, crisis. Jimena, I don't know, have you seen any data related to potentially people who have adopted and want to return? I haven't seen any information on that. I haven't seen specific numbers, but there, 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 are, there is conversation about folks that at the beginning of COVID adopted pets and then are now experiencing financial instability and may now be facing eviction regardless and not knowing what to do with that pet that they just adopted. So mm -hmm. even though there's that moratorium in place, it, it's, there's still so much there, there's still going to be eviction. There's still going to be financial instability. Um, it all depends on how this administration decides to, to support folks that are dealing with this kind of, with the struggles that COVID brought, right? Everyone has been impacted. But no matter what, the housing crisis is going to be a problem and it is already being a problem. We've been talking with shelters that are already seeing people being evicted, even though the moratorium is in place. Wow. Um, we're seeing landlords that are using loopholes such as pet behavior or other situations to, to get them out. Sometimes we're even seeing that um, landlords will send renters a text saying, oh, you're going to be evicted. And so tenants think that they have to leave even though the moratorium is in place and they have protections in place. And so they end up leaving anyway out of fear. Um, and when tenants don't know their rights, you know, it, it, that doesn't help either. So that's another conversation we're having with our shelters is um, aside from connecting folks with human resources is how can they host know your right uh, events or just provide those rights for folks even before they're evicted so they can mm. actually protect themselves and their families. And coming from like a training standpoint myself, 
a big fear that I have with all of these dogs who were adopted throughout the pandemic is there's going to be some serious behavioral stuff going on with a lot of these pets, you know, uh, they've never, if you adopted a puppy during the pandemic and your puppy doesn't know what it's like to have you go to work every day, yeah. um, that's going to be a challenge for a lot of people. Do you guys offer any sort of assistance is like training and behavior, a part of the, the, the model, the program model to help people and animals stay together? Yes. So the three most common reasons for owner related surrender in the United States is housing, medical and behavior. Um, And I think that the both anecdotal and actual data would back that up. Um, Oh, yeah. (laughs) Yes. So we address all three of those things in our program model and is even in the eviction prevention toolkit that we've um, talked about. So there's a behavior section. We have a variety of recommendations for shelters to implement, whether that be with connecting just basic behavior resources that already exist in the world, like YouTube videos and instructional pamphlets um, to actual behavior helplines where you could call into the shelter and speak with somebody on the shelter team about your behavior concerns. Um, Other shelters have even implemented volunteer-based behavior training So you bring your animal to the shelter, you meet with volunteers who've been specially trained and they can help you work through your behavior issues with your animal. That's an awesome solution. Like, like it's, and it's, it makes such a huge impact. And I think one of the other things that was really fascinating to me about all of this, and if you guys have the numbers on it, I I geek out when, when we have those kind of numbers, but the amount of funding that can actually go into the public as almost a, like, it's not a foster program because you're keeping your dog but i mean Mm -hmm. that's uh, in uh, correct me if i'm wrong so much more affordable than having a shelter and paying those employees and the overhead and all this to take care of the same dog in a um i don't want to say a a much worse environment because the shelters that i've been to some of them are phenomenal so i'm not trying to say that (laughs) but i think it's safe to say that a soft um comfortable and familiar environment for a dog is going to be better than a new environment that has a concrete floor in a in a cot listen a shelter environment is not an ideal place for any animal all of animal welfare is pretty much on that 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 same page it's better to be in a home it's better to be with a family better both to be with a person than to be in a shelter environment even though shelters have come an amazingly far away and are doing great things. Um, at least in Tucson, it on average costs about $100 a day to house a dog, an adult dog um, in the facility. And that accounts for medical food, you know, all the different types of things that that, that comes with. Um, if the issue is food insecurity, I mean, it's, it's a $5 bag of food. We could keep them with their family. And even if you maintain that through the month and you're doing $5 a week through the, through the month by providing the physical food, that's going to be less expensive for the community and the taxpayer. If you want to put it in monetary terms, mm-hmm. <laughs> then, then it would be to just provide that food. So it's both a, a humanitarian and, and, you know, mental, emotional connection that we like to support um, a moral thing. We'd like to keep families together, but also financially it's, it's better for communities to keep pets with their people. Agreed. We're going to take a quick break, come back with more amazing information about Haas and uh, these fabulous ladies. The storks are bringing me a baby brother. We can do this together. All right, let's go. Storks know how to keep kids safe. Do you? What? Oh my gosh, you don't know. (gasps) I know. You don't. (laughs) Oh man, you laugh when you're uncomfortable. (laughs) No. Making sure your child is in the right car seat is one of the steps to safer travel. I will rock this. You will rock this. To know for sure that your child is in the right car seat for their age and size, visit safercar.gov slash the right seat. Cool, cool, cool. Very cool, very cool. Brought to you by the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration and the Ad Council. It's It's important important to plan plan ahead for emergencies. emergencies. Like Like the the storm. storm. When When it it kicked kicked in, in, we had a plan. We We were were able to get in touch with each other in no time. We had no idea how to find each other. The The whole experience was was the most frightening 10 hours of my life. If If there's there's one piece of advice advice I'd offer other moms moms out there, there, it's to stay calm and keep to the plan. Some parents plan ahead. Some don't. Make sure you know where to find your family in an emergency. Start your plan at ready.gov. Brought to you by FEMA and the Ad Council. 
Now more than ever, family matters, and Surratt Law Practice has your family in mind. Kimberly Surratt and her team have been helping maintain healthy families through their holistic approach to adoption and surrogacy, child custody, estate planning, and more for over 13 years. Your family law concerns are in caring hands with Surratt Law. Schedule your private consultation with a compassionate Surratt Law Practice team member today by calling 775-636-8200 or visiting lawyersforfamilies.com. Surratt Law, where family matters. Allison is perfect. I mean, she'd never tell you that. She's humble and perfect. She likes everyone. She even likes her untidy roommate's weird guinea pig. Allison, wait, are you texting and driving? Allison, no, that's the exact opposite of what I was just saying about you. Why, Allison, why? Texting and driving makes good people look bad. Visit StopTextStopRex.org. Brought to you by the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration and the Ad Council. I'm Paul George of the Indiana Pacers. When I was six, my days were spent playing basketball. When I was six, my dream was to make it to the NBA. When I was six, my mom had a stroke. So I want you to learn to spot a stroke fast. F-A-S-T. F, face drooping. A, arm weakness. S, speech difficulty. T, time to call 911. I'm Paul George. Spot a stroke fast. Visit strokeassociation.org. Brought to you by the American Stroke Association and the Ad Council. My name is Lola Silvestri, and I'm going to be 95 this year. I was very independent. I fell, and I had to have meals on wheels. America, let's do lunch. One in six seniors faces the threat of hunger, and millions more live in isolation. Drop off a hot meal and say a quick hello. Volunteer for Meals on Wheels by donating your lunch break at americaletsdolunch.org. This message brought to you by Meals on Wheels America and the Ad Council. You're listening to Phoenix Media. Listen live and explore more great shows at phoenixmedia.us. So this has all been incredible. I have um, maybe, I don't know if it's a touchy subject or even properly how to word it. Um, Me and my family personally are going, well, have gone through a situation where, um, and it's going to be unique, but somebody abandoned their dog into our backyard and they didn't do it um, like because they didn't care. They didn't take the dog and throw it over the fence. It's actually a really, it was a sweet story. This, this poor guy had to walk in and say goodbye to his dog on our back porch and and then walked out and um the 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 where i'm struggling on this is i'm going to put myself in his shoes in that we have shelters here in reno we have some great shelters here in reno but there's there's so much confusion on like what was what would actually happen to my dog and she's a pit so her name's lucy and she's a pit mix and so there's all of these different confusions now with a program like Haas, you guys would encourage you would have tried to find a way to help keep the dog with him mm. but at the same time there's going to be other situations where m- maybe the situation it's better there's it's a better environment for the animal to find a new home Mm -hmm. Um, like i can think of all of those different things how do you guys balance that like the where it's the uh, the, because ultimately we're trying to decide between quality of life for Mm -hmm. the animal and the human Mm -hmm. and quality of life for just the animal because there's the the situation is so, so unique and like the last thing that I would want to see, and I'm sorry, I'm just rambling here, but to be like, no, 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 keep the dog, keep the dog, keep the dog or the cat or whatever it is. And then you find out that it was actually an emotionally destructive situation for both of them. It was, how do you, how do you guys balance that without uh, guilting people into keeping their animals as well? So the cool thing about Liana and I coming on board is because we're coming also with a social work background um, mm. and meeting families where they're at, meeting individuals where they're at is, is, a, is one of the main goals that we're trying to p- push through Haas for all shelter staff. Um, and through that, we're talking about case management. And in case management, when you meet an individual where they're at, um, you're asking questions and you're listening to their story. You're trying to get the whole perspective of where they're coming from, what they've been going through, what they've already tried to do. Um, and if their main goal is they do wanna keep their pet, 
then we have to find out what are all the different things going on, what are all the different ways that we can support them so that they can stay together. So we don't know the whole story, right? Like I don't know what he was going through or or if he if he ultimately did want to keep his pet but feel, felt like he couldn't, then how can we figure that out together, right? Mm-hmm. But in the end, there's a whole other side to it. And in the end, if it wasn't the right situation, if he decided that it was better for his pet to be with someone else, then that's also valid because we want our folks to have agency and we want them to be able to make those decisions on their own. Um, so it's, it's not so much about guilting them. It's about trying to assess the situation and figure out what's best yeah, for him and for the pet. Um, but it's a lot, it's a lot of listening. It's a lot of um, not being judgmental. Um, and, it, and it's some, it's also about like using words like abandonment, like abandonment, it has a really negative connotation. Mm-hmm. And, and we're trying to move away from that because again, that puts a judgment on him. And who knows, we don't know all that he tried, all that he loved for that pet. So it's trying to like work through him and work for him and try to figure out how we can help that whole family stay together. And that was like when we were sharing that story, that was tough, like trying to find another word. Uh, Surrender doesn't feel like a good word. Abandonment doesn't feel like a good word. Like there's such a negative connotation to people that are oftentimes just trying to improve their pets' lives. Yeah. And I I like relinquish personally. Yeah. They're all tough. It's it's all... It's all tough. And sorry, I wasn't, I didn't want to imply that you guys were guilting people into keeping their animals. (laughs) No, no. I was was more... um, uh, just trying to well, like, you kind of did jason it felt like I, I know i know it came out that way and, and, but it, it could it could come off pushy right if our goal is to keep pets and family together but our goal is also to meet people where they're at and try and figure out what's the best for them because not every situation is going to mean that they're going to stay together mm-hmm. um, but the more we can talk to folks the more we can figure like work together then more families can stay together Mm-hmm. And I think that's the key, like the human animal part of it, mm-hmm. right? It's like making sure that the situation overall is going to be the best for all involved. Because, right. you know, when you're looking at like family structure, you have to look at the the health of the entire family, right. um, including their pets. So where are you guys, where are you guys located? Cause I, I like to think that we have a listener in every city across the United States. Um, but if somebody was going through a situation like this, um, what would you suggest their actions be to either get help or make these great decisions or like and improve their lives? What, what would be the steps? Well, well, first I would certainly say to take a look, um, either on the internet or on your three, one, one, a lot of communities have like phone numbers you can call to find out where your nearest animal shelter is. Um, And frankly, just contact them and see what the resources exist in the community that you live in. Um, Most of our Haas tier one shelters that are implementing programming um, are in major cities across the United States. So San Diego, Oakland, Denver, Tucson, um, New York. I mean, the list goes on. Um, We even have a tier one shelter in Arkansas. Um, so we're all over the country, but there's even more shelters that are doing similar work to this that aren't in our tier one. So mm. your community may have these resources available. Um, right now we're, we're working on making sure those things are advertised. Um, but I would say to call your animal shelter or animal rescue and find out what resources are available prior to surrendering. Um, we're also making a push for people to reach out for resources before they enter crisis. So if you know that potentially you're facing eviction three months from now, call your animal shelter now um, because they may be able to connect you with legal resources, free legal resources in your community um, that can advocate for you in those three months so that maybe you don't get evicted or maybe you find transitional housing before you have to live in your car. Um, we want to make sure that everybody's getting these, these essential community resources. Jimena, you could probably elaborate to a greater extent on that. Yeah, well, another really cool thing that a lot of our shelters are implementing is temporary boarding. So if you're a family that you know you're about to get evicted and um, you don't know how long you'll be in your car or in transitional housing or just in between places, some shelters are providing temporary placement. So it's basically boarding, um, but you get your pet back or fostering, but you get your pet back. So it's not like fostering to be adopted in a new home. It's fostering to, to, they're just temporarily holding your dog. And that's even better because if you know your dog is in a home um, and living with other people and not at the shelter for like three, four weeks at a time, and that that just makes life easier. And then you know, you're gonna get your pet back. 
So a lot of shelters are really, really working on making sure um, that families can stay together. So yeah, reach out to your shelter. And that's the, that's the tricky part that we've been trying to figure out is how do we get to folks before mm. before they're, they're dealing with the eviction? You come like on the in crisis. Podcast yeah. So yeah. We can exactly. tell everybody about it. <laughs> right. Yeah. right. I think my other question would be, how do we... Oh my gosh, that's so funny. I saw your cat and somehow I thought the cat was in my room. <laughs> I was like, ah, there's a cat in here. I don't know. <laughs> that was weird. Um, my question would be, how do we start addressing the issue with pet friendly housing? Like, how do we start educating landlords? Too. You know, because like a big problem, I live in Los Angeles, huge metropolitan city. Finding pet friendly housing is so rare, so impossible, more expensive. Now they want you to pay like rent for your pet. They'll double your um, de your security deposit. Do you still you know, have breed, breed restrictions there in California? Oh, huge yeah. breed restrictions like pit bulls are like they make it so difficult for you or the they'll let you live here, but you can't be insured by the insurance so you have to have your and then they require you to have your own insurance in order to be in the rental and this is for just like an, a, an apartment rental mm -hmm. so it's becoming it feels more insurmountable to be a pet family even though we live in one of the most pet friendly cities in the country yep. you know like the los angeles shelters got drained during the pandemic like yeah. i had clients who were like i was on a wait list for four months there were just no dogs to adopt so how do we start addressing that like how do we start addressing this issue of a kind of a bias against people with pets being in rentals it's very weird humana would you like to <laughs> well um so hsus humane society of the united states has really worked hard on how to how to like guide folks in that conversation with landlords and they've created this really awesome guide on that it's called pets are welcome um, toolkit I believe and in that it has different ways to advocate for yourself or for advocate to, or to advocate for other families and how to start those conversations with landlords um, just emphasizing the importance of the human animal bond, emphasizing the importance of pets and what they mean in people's families um, and what it would mean to lose tenants that have pets, um, things like that. And so that, that kind of a resource is super, super helpful. Um, and you can easily find that on the HSUS website if you're interested in looking that up. But it's definitely the conversations we've had are about building those relationships and partnerships with housing agencies, with landlords, with apartment complexes, um, so that they also have a buy-in, right? Once we build that relationship and we and they see the importance of, of giving more opportunities to families, to them to have pets, then, then, it, then hopefully, you know, that can help build that better relationship. And hopefully they can see the importance of reducing those restrictions and reducing those barriers. And then the other important thing to know for people to know is that if they have an emotional support animal, they're not, you can't be charged with pet fees and deposits. Like there are rights for people that have ESAs. Um, and a lot of times they're, they don't know that and they're getting charged. So it's super important if you have an ESA to look up your rights so that you're, you're protecting yourself and your pet. We're even seeing now like moving away from the breed restrictions and saying, oh, you can't have an animal under 25 pounds. Well, mm -hmm. that very clearly keeps certain breeds legal in that apartment complex and others not. Um, so absolutely knowing your rights is so important. Same with service do dogs, service animals, um, as well as emotional support animals. Um, that's really essential. And in knowing that if you have an emotional support animal, that breed restriction or that weight limit that legally doesn't apply to you, yeah. um, which I mean, I think many of us, even working in animal welfare, have faced landlords who tell us, um, you know, no, absolutely, you can't have that. And you're like, well, no, I and actually I, I can't. <laughs> actually, I can't. But that's part of our really pushing for people to know their rights and connect with legal resources, because, uh, you know, we've spoken with fair housing attorneys who say, you know, this pet deposit is illegal according to this city's guidelines. But mm. you would not know that as a renter unless you really looked up the legal jargon and the average yeah. person won't and doesn't know it. I mean, I certainly don't. So and I think, too, like as someone who I took a 
randomly real estate law class. I had, my, I had my realtor's license for like two years when I was 19. But so I took a real estate law class. And one of the things that I will never forget from that class is that most people do not know that the courts always go in favor of the tenant, not the landlord. And so when you're being bullied by your landlord, it's very scary. The threat of homelessness is yeah. very scary, yeah. you know, especially if you love your pets and your family, you know, you're like, oh, I don't want to, what would I do with my dog if I became homeless? You know, that's a real yeah. frightening thing to come face to face with. And he meant something that you said that I picked up on that I think is just so valuable is we, we are becoming more and more and more a pet owning society. And if you as a landlord are isolating pet parents, you're literally limiting how many units you can rent in your building because you're isolating a huge demographic of often wealthy or <laughs> middle class, you know, who probably can pay their rent on time because they're, you know, avid pet owners. So, yeah, I just think it's a really interesting balance. I think we need to have a larger conversation about how we really start to expand uh, restrictions and make highlight these laws that help people understand like, hey, you can't be charged that pet deposit. That's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. You know, a thousand extra dollars is not <laughs> reasonable or legal. No. This is Mario Andretti. You know me as a race car driver. But I'm also a Meals on Wheels volunteer. I've raced against the sport's biggest personalities, but I've never met more vibrant, amazing people than the seniors served by Meals on Wheels. You can make a difference by dropping off a hot meal and saying a quick hello. So, America, let's do lunch. Volunteer your lunch break at americaletsdolunch.org. This message brought to you by Meals on Wheels America and the Ad Council. People been saying to your friend, get a different face. And posting on their feed, they're super ugly. The things they say to them online are cruel and they're not true. So tell your friend, I'll stand up for you. Don't worry, I know what to do. Know someone being bullied online? You can be a witness and make a difference by letting the world know it isn't cool. And by letting your friend know you care. Learn more at eyewitnessbullying.org. Brought to you by the Ad Council. Hope you enjoyed your meal. And I just want to say, he's lucky to have a brother like you. Lucky? Caring for my brother is far from easy. But he's a part of me, like my arms and legs, so I'll be his. No time for tired. Nothing can disable this love. He needs me, but I'm the lucky one, even though I need help now and then. If you're caring for a loved one, visit aarp.org slash caregiving for care guides and community. Support for your strength. Brought to you by AARP and the Ad Council. Most of my family, they never graduated high school, so I'm trying to break that barrier. My daughter, Brooklyn, was also a motivation for me to go back to school. Every day after work, went straight to school, and it paid off. At age 26, Kareem finished his high school diploma. I could not have done it alone. I see the future is really bright for me. No one gets a diploma alone. If you're thinking of finishing your high school diploma, you have help. Find free adult education classes near you at finishyourdiploma.org. Brought to you by the Dollar General Literacy Foundation and the Ad Council. So I'm a cat, and I just moved in with this new human, and she's got this little toy she's always playing with, all day long. Tap, 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 bloop, bloop. She can't put it down. There it is. Oh, and get this. She even talks to it. Last week, she asked it for Chinese, and guess what? Egg rolls showed up, like magic. Humans have cool toys. A person is the best thing to happen to a shelter pet. Be that person. Adopt. Brought to you by the Ad Council and the ShelterPetProject.org. What if I told you that a tornado was going to happen tomorrow, right where you live? That it would touch down at exactly 3.17 p.m. and I told you the exact path it would take. You would, of course, prepare. You would talk with your loved ones and you'd make a plan today. It's true, I can't tell you a tornado will strike tomorrow. But shouldn't you have a plan anyway? Go to ready.gov communicate and make your emergency plan today. Don't wait. Communicate. Brought to you by FEMA and the Ad Council. You're listening to Phoenix Media. Listen live and explore more great shows at phoenixmedia.us. Um, 
So w- w- one more big question for me, and you guys have mentioned that you, there's like the, the tier one shelters, and, and I, I would love to know, is, is tier one like your top or is it the entry level? I don't know what, what that is. <laughs> um, but also, um, how do how would like a shelter or like, do you guys only work with shelters? Do you guys work with rescues, sanctuaries, like at-home moms? Like, like who all can get involved with, with Haas mm. at that level? Mm. So the tier one, right now we're shifting. So we have a tier one and a tier two, and there's a total of 38 shelters. 19 of them are tier one. Um, but the tier one uh, were the first shelters that committed to implementing programming, committed to a certain amount of time of week and attending our, um, our meetings, our workshops, our working groups, but also have committed to provide data in regards to all the work that's being done. So it's a really large commitment from the tier one groups. The tier two groups, they're involved, they want to learn, they're starting to implement programming, but they haven't, it's not so much as a commitment as the tier one groups. Um, But right now we're shifting towards just a huge group of pilot shelters so that they won't be so divided as tier one and tier two. I believe it's going to be like 24 of them total. Um, And I forgot where I was going. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and so, so how do like how do they get involved so so tier one okay. sounds like they're the first people that came on board and they're they're the ones that have really been committed to helping you they're like in this to the win direction that you, <laughs> that you're trying to take this like you guys have your mission and you have your your direction that you're trying to to push that's so adorable I, like, my dog just opened the door my dogs I'm have been barking outside too i almost had to get up to go because he'll he'll bark and yeah like, he i he wanted, jumped I wanted, up like at the beginning of the podcast and was okay. like i'm a part of this <laughs> So I didn't lock the door. That's my fault. <laughs> your tier one is your group that, you know, is essentially partnered with you to start giving you the data so that you can share with the rest of the community on how to bring people on. And your tier two is the next group that's going to be following in behind them. But I know that there's going to be people that are listening to this show that it, it um, like it, it seems like a great stamp of approval. Like this is something else that I'm going to add in to what mm. we're doing. This is this is what I want the community to know about my organization that I care about the human animal bond. And it's not just about saving animals from the bad <laughs> humans. It's about improving the, the relationship and the conditions and the environment for everybody involved. So, uh, so how would people get involved? Or yeah. And sorry involved? about that. I totally remember where I was going. <laughs> um, yeah. So all of the, the, the organizations we partner with, are specifically shelters, but we have rescues. um, We have different organizations. We have a bunch of different people that have gotten involved um, and they can get involved by going through our website. It's the humananimalsupportservices.org. And there's this great big button that says get involved. And the biggest way to get involved is to not only attend our meetings, but to join a working group. Mm -hmm. We have about 36 working groups that range from many different topics um, that all involve getting creative and brainstorming how to reimagine that topic. So the topic could be the facility, how to reimagine what a shelter facility can look like, Mm. um, or how to reimagining what budgeting looks like, or fundraising, or um, keeping families together. We have our own working group. Um, or One Health, integrating the the perspective of One Health into this movement. So there are 36 of those, and in each group, there are tons and tons of people from all these different organizations that are coming together to talk about this and to to try and create new deliverables, new resources, new materials, develop surveys. Um, So they're just putting a lot of time in each week, and these are all volunteers. So Mm -hmm. they all have their full-time jobs. They're, They're committing their time, extra time to come in and have these conversations. And Haas wouldn't be anything if it weren't for all of these collaborators, because we, we've, we like I said, it's over 600 collaborators, all these, all these different minds coming together to really try and see how we can reimagine animal sheltering. And it's really important to acknowledge, I think that our Keeping Families Together Eviction Prevention Toolkit was made possible through the collaboration of that working group that Humana mentioned, as well as the Humane Society of the United States um, and the Association for Animal Welfare and Advancement. Um, They hugely helped us. It's not just Humana and I (laughs) typing away. So um, people definitely can get involved. And whether it's creating deliverables like the toolkit that we have released or just improving the programming that we're recommending for um tier one shelters and tier two shelters and um, there's absolutely opportunities for people to get involved 
And on top of that, sorry, really quickly, we yeah, also no. had the collaboration of all the different shelters. So we had the working groups of shelters, HSUS, the association, and then we had Spring Point Foundation to fund this program. So just wanted to shout them out too. Hey, <laughs> yeah. And I mean, really, this is one of those things where like it is going to take a village because if we start reimagining the way we think about the dollar, you know, early on in the podcast, we talked about like cost per acquisition, right? And yep. if you want to break it down like that, and it's like, if we're talking about just shifting and reimagining budgeting in terms of like, do we budget for animals in a shelter or do we right. budget to spend our tax dollars to keep animals in homes? Like how we all start to think about animal welfare together is going to help improve and change the way we start caring for not only animals in the welfare system, but the families that they often times have to leave behind sometimes unwill unwillingly, you know, it's, it's a big decision to relinquish your pet. And I think that if we start to have more conversations about why and how we can help people of all socioeconomic backgrounds be pet parents and be animal people, that's when we're really going to start to reap the benefits of, you know, our entire community being able to experience the joy of having a pet in their family, the, the emotional support of having the animal. Cause I think we all, we all need that. It's such an important tool for mm -hmm. compassion and love. Absolutely. Totally agree. Wow, we hit another. We, we hit another. I'm sorry. You and your, well, like, just, just leave yeah. everybody agreeing and I'm just, has like, <laughs> like well, jump listen. in on those things. I mean, it's, it's, <laughs> I'm very excited and I've been absorbing for like most of this. <laughs> I've just been sitting over here like just sucking it all in. But I really think it's so important. And, you know, as, as like a rabid, dog mom and uh, and and person who's been involved in animal welfare and now on the other side of animal welfare where like now I dedicate my life to really helping pets and parents stay together through like addressing these behavioral issues that so often lead to animals going into shelters. I think it's just such an important conversation that like nationally needs to be had. Um, and I think that uh, ultimately the conversation might lead to how we reimagine pets as not being property. And I think mm. that that's, that's kind of where we're headed, which is exciting. That's a whole nother podcast. That's a whole <laughs> other. <laughs> well, and, and then just another really exciting component of Haas is that all of these shelters, so I'm new to the animal welfare field, but when I first started, the biggest conversation that was happening is that all these different animal shelters were siloed. Everyone was working mm -hmm. on their own. A lot of them were kind of like, against each other yeah, competitive it's a weirdly yeah. competitive industry oh, i never yeah. understood it so odd yeah and but this is the first time we have our like national calls on mondays and fridays and there are over 150 people on there from all these different shelters aside from tier one tier two like all these different collaborators and it's so cool to see so many people wanting to work together and wanting to just just make things better together. So it's really, really awesome and inspiring to see how this movement has created more unity across across mm -hmm. the industry, for sure. I think the other well, thing that I've loved about this conversation, sorry, and I, I want no, you to- No, go ahead. Uh, I was just um, gonna say, ultimately that's better for the people and pets of all of our community. Mm -hmm. when, yeah. when our shelters, our rescues, our organizations communicate and collaborate, it's better for everyone. That's why yes. we, that competitiveness is, it's, there's no it place doesn't for work. It. Yep. And that's I mean, what I've, again, I, that's what I've loved about it. Like everything that we've talked about today has had, and there's a huge financial shift on what you guys are doing that we haven't touched on hardly at all. Everything's been the emotional shift, the um, communication between other groups. How does, how are, how are we all coming together to help each other and the animals that are involved? Mm -hmm. Not just um, how am I going to do something better than what you're doing? And how are mm -hmm. you like, like that's where you start seeing that competitive edge. And then it becomes, comes down to like the fundraising dollars. Like everybody's like, who's going to come to this and who's going to come to that and donate this. Mm -hmm. Um, so, and then the same thing, like, I really love how we've touched on the emotional side of this is about helping people either help their animals or help themselves at the mm -hmm. same exact time. So that's like, that is what I've genuinely loved learning about Haas and what you guys are doing and really making that impact. So bravo to yeah. you guys. Amazing. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's literally not about who does it best. Yeah. It's about how we do it better together. And I, I so empowering. Well, anyways, ladies, 
this is the end of our show. We do end our show in a very special way every single time. And if you've not listened to one of our podcasts, well, then you are in for a treat. <laughs> Jason, you ready? As this will one. ever be. Okay, this is going to are ready. I'm just going to put it out there. Okay, good. What do you get when you cross a dog and a calculator? What? A friend you can count on. Oh, <laughs> oh dear. Well, I thought dad, that I would be sweet for today. Hashtag dog dad. Dog joke. dad jokes. <laughs> yep. Also saying dog dad. So it's a mouthful. Yes. We'll leave you with that. Thank you, ladies, so much. Thank you guys so Liana, much. Liana, Jimena, it was amazing to speak to you both. Thank you for sharing your wonderful organization. We can't wait we to can't, have you yeah, back. We can't wait to have you guys on again because like, we, yeah. so many there's topics. so much to talk we about. Just kept on going on. Thank you for having us. Yeah, Absolutely. thank you so much for having us. Cool. I just wanted to take a quick minute to thank Jimena and Liana from Haas Human Animal Support Services for coming on with us today. And for all of you for listening, anything that you heard today on today's podcast, any of these resources, amazing information that we talked about can be found um, and linked in the show notes and also at the dogishpodcast.com. As always, my wonderful co-host, Jason, thank you for driving the conversation forward with your amazing questions. I love being here. Yes. Um, please make sure to check us out on all social media platforms. You can find Jason at Forever USA, me at Dog Up in This Bitch, and obviously the podcast at The Dogish Podcast. Um, and don't forget to go check out Haas and really yes, learn about what they're doing. Yes, please check I mean, out Haas. Huge impact. Yes, so, especially if you all... need that support, you know, during this time. They have Absolutely. great resources. Anyways, if you're not already subscribed, you should be by this point. Come on, people. Seriously. And uh, um, if there's a topic personality or uh, anything else that you would love to hear about on our show please tell us we would love to have them on too we'll see you guys all next week well we'll hear you all that's right <laughs> talk to you then bye